This is episode number two of Boardwalk Talks, your Toronto real estate investing show. Like you said, time is going to pass, right? If you go with a 25-year amortized mortgage, if you're 20 years old, you're going to be 45 with a, a free and clear condo, right? Um, set it, forget it, let it grow over time, and that kind of sets you in for your diversification. You'll have mutual funds. You'll still be able to have excess mon- money to save. Um, you'll have, you know... Uh, You're tuned in to Boardwalk Talks with Monopoly Group Toronto, where we give you the latest news, tips, and tricks all about real estate investing so that you too can climb the property ladder. Visit us at torontomonopoly.ca. Hey everyone, welcome to our second podcast, second episode of Boardwalk Talks with the Toronto Monopoly Group. I'm your host, Ken, with my co-host, Jonathan Wong. What's up? How are you guys doing today? All right, all right. How are you? I'm good. I heard we have a very special guest today. Yeah, we got our special guest, Ryan Dennehauer of Bespoke Mortgage Group. What's uh, he, we met a long time ago from uh, when you used to work at TD and you've taken, I've seen your career explode. Um, you've helped me with my personal mortgages. Thank you very much for that. And um, you just want to, good to have you on the talk about investing in real estate. Yeah, thanks for having me guys. Of course, I'm super excited. So basically, um, as you guys know, the whole premise is we're talking about real estate investing today. Um, Ryan, you, you, you've you've changed your, it's, well, first of all, let's talk about how we met. So we met, you were just a, 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 kid. <laughs> a little kid, yeah, and at TD, working as a teller, well, not a teller, as a financial advisor, I think. Yeah, yeah. And uh, tell everyone where, where you've taken your career since. Yeah, so uh, obviously loved working at TD. You learned a lot, met a lot of great people, such as yourself. Um, but uh, it just kind of got to the point that I was only able to help 50% of my clients, right? So uh, clients would get referred to me, uh, either they fit in that box or they didn't uh, as far as mortgage approvals go. Um, so I got thinking and decided, hey, why don't I go over to the broker side where I have a lot more options, uh, access um, for approvals for clients. Um, so decided to make that transition over into the broker space where I still work with TD, I still work with a lot of the big banks, but now I just have uh, access to over 40 other lenders. So if we're looking at competitive interest rates or uh, ways to structure financing differently, we have a lot more options for our clients. That's awesome, and 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 all the awards I see in your back wall there. That's uh... oh, yeah. I know conveniently. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know there. So okay, um, I assume you work with a lot of first-time investors as well too, right? Yes. Yes. So uh, some people have equity in their homes, or maybe you know they they don't even have a home; they just go straight to investing. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Like what uh, what programs do you have? Like what kind of scenarios have you seen of people that are uh, you know sitting on on pretty low mortgages? I guess. Yeah, so um, again, the possibilities are endless, right? So uh, if I can give any advice to any kind of first-time investors or, um, you know, let's just say even seasoned investors, it's to plan as early as possible. Um, So, you know, what I mean by that is it's a lot easier to obtain financing and obtain options um, at the beginning of your investing career uh, or even you know when you're starting to build your portfolio. So what I mean by that is looking at options where you can get home equity lines of credits uh, secured against your property. So as your tenants are paying down that mortgage or even if you're paying down that mortgage, the equity is readily available for you to use on future investments. Right. Um, again, I can go into various programs and we do have access to, to many of them. Um, all I have to say is that every deal is different. And, um, you know, what happens, you know, more than often where clients get declined on a file, let's just say from their bank, uh, and they completely give up on, on, you know, pursuing that dream of buying a second property or buying that first investment property, um, shop around right contact your bank contact a broker contact someone like myself i'd love to give you an option um and kind of go through uh some potential opportunities that uh, are available to you but every bank is different meaning that different banks will factor in the rental income that they're using on your application um different than others so some some will use 50 percent of your rental income, some will use 100% and offset your expenses. Um, and again, you know, Ken, you and I could talk from experience. Uh, very recently, we did a transaction together, and uh, I think you were quite surprised with the financing options you had available to you, um, which, uh, again, I told you as soon as I saw it, we'd be able to make it happen. I don't know if you uh, you believed in me. I knew you had faith in me. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, shit, you can't. impossible. <laughs> you know, the thing I love about you is that you always pull magic uh, rabbits out of a hat somewhere. I don't know how you do it all, but you get the funding, which is great. Yeah. So, speaking and of programs. Uh, your options, right, at the end of the day. It's knowing that we have access to multiple lenders and, uh, you know, just want to throw it out there for our audience and anyone watching. Um, being a mortgage broker, we don't only work with private lenders. So I know that there's a stigma. I don't want to go to a broker because I'm going to get sent to a private lender. A private lender is a great solution for some, but it's not our first choice. It's kind of a, of a backup uh, a plan for, uh, for some, some people. Okay, we still approach the institutional lenders, the big banks, uh, the monoline lenders, which are still A lenders um, and provide really, really competitive interest rates. Um, so we have access to a wide range. So don't uh, assume that we're gonna go to, you know, someone who has a suitcase full of money to get you financing. It doesn't work that way. But you do have that, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, so I, I know that John's working right now with a lot of first time um, purchasers, a lot of uh, people that are trying to house hack their way into uh, investing. So that means like living upstairs, renting out the basements, things like that. Uh, maybe buy an older home that needs uh, renovations. So you, you mentioned some programs. Um, one of the ones I really, really love is the Purchase Plus Improvements. Do you guys okay. have yeah. that? Is, is something, can people get loans on the construction portion of their uh, funding? Yes. Say you so buy something for 900,000 or a million bucks, right? Is that the yeah. price point you're looking at, John? John? Yeah, actually, just for the just for our viewers, just in case you know what's going on. I plan on selling my current condo right now. I'm planning on buying a home out in Leslieville. Um, this home's now it's probably going to be a good job. It's going to need a lot of work. So yeah, this it's a, it's a good question to ask Ryan. Actually, if I buy a home, for example, that needs serious renovations, are you guys able to fund me any sort of money for that project? Yeah, for the renovations. Yes. Yeah. So we do have access to Purchase Plus Improvements programs. Um, these are great programs, but there is some fine print behind them. Okay, so um, again, it, it's great for someone wanting to go into a house and, and needing money to change a kitchen or, um, you know, change a, a, a bathroom. Um, even you can do some pretty serious renovations as long as they're not structural. Uh, renovations okay um, but essentially the way that this program works is you can purchase a property and the bank will give you up to um, up to fifty thousand um, dollars in order to renovate and do potential renovations on this property okay now fifty thousand dollars is kind of a, of a standard depending on the strength of the deal and the client we have gotten exceptions from uh, institutional lenders to increase um, that amount right we have done some deals in the past where um, we got $80,000 for renovations, okay? Now the fine print behind this is the bank will lend you this money on funding. So let's just say you're closing on October the 1st, okay? On October the 4th, uh, 1st, the mortgage money is going to um, come into your account. Uh, it's gonna get deposited into the lawyer's account. The lawyer's gonna close your transaction and that extra $50,000 needs to stay in the lawyer's account. Okay, you will not get access to that money, which means essentially you have to finance um, those renovations uh, or those improvements yourself. Uh, and then once it is completed, you will get reimbursed those costs because those costs are sitting in the lawyer's trust account. Okay, so, um, you know, sometimes people, they, they don't plan ahead of time as far as how they're gonna pay, um, uh, pay for those renovations. We give them options such as, you know, perhaps uh, parents or family or friends are willing to give them money. Uh, perhaps they have other financing options to, sh to, to finance those renovations short term um, or suggestions that I give into clients and perhaps if we have any viewers that are contractors are talking to their contractors letting them know that the money is sitting in trust in the lawyer's trust account are they willing to complete the renovation and once it's completed those funds would then get uh, dispersed to that contractor. Um, again, you know, this could potentially open up a new, a, a whole new line of business for contractors out there. Um, you know, perhaps there has to be some extra due diligence done between the contractors, the clients and the lawyers, but the money is there. Um, it's just a matter of getting access to it once those rentals are completed. Yeah, that's awesome. Line, I mean, the bank is just a little bit worried about potentially this line could run off with the money or? Um, yeah, so uh, potentially the client uh, states that they're going to do the rentals. They are going to, um, you know, let's just say put in a new kitchen, put in a new bathroom, um, you know, put in new flooring, and then they don't end up doing it. 
right? So essentially by holding on to that money, once those rentals are, are completed, an appraiser is sent out to the home to view um, um, and I guess satisfy the condition that those renovations are completed, right? And then that money would get released uh, from, from the lawyer. Um, there is a timeline as well. So you do have 90 days um, to complete those renovations. Now, mind you, you know, there, there, there's bank policy and then there's always exceptions. So if you're running over, if we have to go and let the bank know that you're running behind and you're gonna need an extra 30 days, 60 days, again, that hasn't been an issue in the past. It's more so if you're looking at doing a project that's gonna take you a year, that might be hard uh, you know, for the bank to give that, uh, that exception on. Sounds good. So uh, that's always good for people looking just to kind of flip homes and all that, or even, you know, kind of buy, uh, uh, renovate, then rent out and then refinance again. So speaking of the last R, which refinance, which is pretty mm -hmm. cool. Um, wh what's the earliest time frame you would say people can refinance? I mean, obviously it depends on the loan that you get, but... Uh, it, it Exactly. Right. So that's why we want to get to know our clients as much as possible, uh, because, you know, let's just say a client purchases a pro purchases a property and they are in a mortgage. We want to plan that exit strategy. It's very important. So, um, you know, if a client planned on purchasing a property, renovating it and wanting to refinance it, um, essentially what we would do is we'd want to plan, you know, potentially an open mortgage or we'd want to uh, plan a variable mortgage where a penalty is only three months interest opposed to a fixed rate mortgage where penalties can be substantial. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of times I think, Ken, you always, you know from firsthand experience is that exit strategies are, are my number one priority. It's always, you know, what are we doing this property? Are we holding on to it? Are we flipping it? Are we selling it? Um, because penalties can eat up a lot of your, you know, uh, of your gains in the future, right? And people's plans change. So, you know, I know that a lot of our viewers who are watching today, or even a, a lot of people who are purchasing property, their main focus is, you know, rate, 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 rate. But potentially you could shop around and get the best lowest possible rate on the market. But when it comes time for you to refinance or flip that property, your savings and interest rate would be get eaten up by the penalties uh, you're potentially paying by breaking that mortgage early. Perfect. And I guess it really depends on what kind of uh, investing you're doing, but sometimes private loans are even better, right? So for that reason, you don't have a strict uh, kind of uh, breaking penalties or anything like that. Yeah, so private, um, I'm a huge fan of private mortgages. For and, renovations. Uh, yes, for, yes, for yes. renovations, for, uh, you know, for purchases, um, it, it all depends on, on the clients, but essentially private lending is, uh, is a true equity um, lending uh, type of financing where you know, we, we obviously uh, do our KYC, so we know our clients, we kind of, uh, you know, gauge as far as what, what the plans are, um, but we're lending on the property itself, right? So you could have poor bruised credit, you could have um, non-confirmable income. Um, there's different ways that we are going to provide financing, and it all depends on that, on that property. So if that Leslieville property is a nice property with um, you know, a, a small mortgage on it, and we're looking at some potential funds for renovations. Private lending is pretty much a guaranteed, uh, a guaranteed thing. However, private lending we will always use as a last resort. So, the mortgage market has changed drastically over the last year, two years. Um, a lot of alternative lenders out there are providing extremely aggressive interest rates at. Um, um, with some favorable uh, solutions for clients where, you know, we could have a client who's self-employed um, and get a mortgage approved for them based off their bank statements, their, their deposits going into their business. Uh, and you're looking at rates, uh, uh, a one-year rate about, I would say between 365 and 4%, very competitive interest rates for, you know, giving bank statements to get your mortgage approved right yeah. um in the event that that wasn't a possibility then we would turn over to the private mortgage the private side which is a lot more guaranteed well you know i, I guess it really depends on the deal that you're getting and if there's enough equity in it that sometimes private does make sense and you know i'm not i'm not against it i actually do kind of like it because the uh the less under like you know less stringent under, underwriting policy yeah i hate those 20 questions that the banks always give you you know you <laughs> take a lot of that away from me so thank you very very much for that um you know there's times where private does make sense and i've used a private for you for for a renovation once before yeah. and um it kind of makes sense right especially for bridge loans and, and things like that as well too yes you know, financing 
you know, yes, it is expensive, but it's just a cost of business, really. And um, if you factor in breaking a, a mortgage penalty in a traditional bank, it, it could actually make sense to private sometimes. Exactly, and every private. So we work with a lot of uh, a lot of private lenders. Uh, we do a lot of private lending ourselves. Every private is different. Uh, right, so uh, depending on you know the project itself, depending on um, the location, depending on the client, uh, on the exit strategy, uh, the prices vary. Okay, um, but again, too, as far as private lending goes, there are you know there's open term options where you could pay back that loan at any point in time without paying penalties. There's some private uh, lenders out there who um, they provide open terms, but it's a three months pe uh, interest penalty to pay it, pay it back, right? So there are so many options when it comes to private lending. The thing I like about it is we have clients who uh, perhaps they look for some financing, they're in a little bit of a bind, they need access to private funds fast. We can turn around private funds in 24 to 48 hours. So it is, uh, you know, in, in some cases, uh, a lifesaver for a lot of clients. Yeah, no, I don't think it should be a, a, a last resort thing all at all times. I think some people should use that as part of their strategy just to kind of, you know, if you have that plan in mind in, in the first place, just to close it really quickly. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's better to take action than not to take action, right? On, on an investment, if you see a deal, don't just not get it because your credit's bruised or you can't you can't qualify for mortgage, you have too many or whatever. Just yeah. grab the place first and then worry about the financing later. That's kind of my- Commit and then figure it out. Yeah, aim, fire, shoot, right? <laughs> so, I don't know, shoot, ready, no, what is it? Fire ready aim. Or, oh <laughs> so, when it comes to uh, private mortgages, what do you think is the biggest like mix, misconception? Because I think, you know, for our viewers, people who are new to the market, new, haven't gotten a mortgage before, the biggest thing is, ooh, it's very taboo. All they hear is like high interest rate. What's the biggest misconception you would say? Um, I would say the the biggest uh, misrepresentation would have to be. Um, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of them. So assuming that private lending is someone um, who, who's going to show up with a, a suitcase filled with cash. Okay. Um, that's not the case. So um, keep in mind that any kind of lending that goes on as far as mortgage lending needs to be closed um, through, uh, through a real estate lawyer. Okay, so even though you are signing commitments um, and, and arranging private lending through, let's just say a broker or a private lender, you're gonna have a lawyer that represents yourself to look through the commitment to make sure that everything makes sense, it's in line, um, and it, um, it, it's actually a good solution for you, right? Um, so the thing I like about private lending as well, a lot of people don't know is that if you're borrowing more than fifty thousand dollars, there's two lawyers that are that are involved. So essentially, it's a slight, slightly greater cost for you as the individual because you are paying um, the lawyer on the lender side and paying the lawyer on your side. But you're having a lawyer prepare the lender's documents, and then you're having your lawyer go through it with you and signing off on it. So if you look at the set of eyes, you kind of got three set of eyes reviewing those documents to make sure that everything makes sense. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, I like that. Um, sometimes we have clients in the past who, you know, they have objections to having to pay an extra thousand dollars in lawyer fees, but hey, you know, it's it's the lawyers doing their due, dil due diligence to make sure that you're protected. Um, and I would say that has to be kind of, you know, the, the biggest misrepresentation that, oh my gosh, look at this extra thousand dollar fee that I'm paying. You know, I don't want to pay this but it's, you know, it, it, it's for their best interest. Yeah, it's independent legal advice. You absolutely need to have that. So, and there's also the discharge costs as well too. But, you know, at the end of the day, I guess, I, I think we should really separate the distinguish between hard money and private lending. When we say private, I guess you're really talking about hard money because private money really could be in your, your, you know, you borrow from your parents or your sister, your brother yeah. kind of thing, right? So this is more hard money where you're, you're borrowing funds from an individual investor or a group of investors or even fund itself and you're uh, registering the, the loan on title and the underwriting is less strict and it's very flexible, the terms are more flexible and you can negotiate all that stuff. Yeah, I think that's what we're talking about, right? So when we say private, we really mean hard money. Correct. So now let's flip the gears a little bit. Instead of thinking about borrowing from hard money or, or private, uh, what about investing into private? So say you don't ha quite have the, you know, two, 300,000 it might take to buy a million dollar house for the down payment and you have about 50,000. Can they invest in you uh, in a private mortgage with you? Yeah, so we actually do, uh, we do a lot of private lending in our office. Um, again, um, the, the advice that I can give the, to people that want to get into private lending is um, work with, um, you know, essentially I'm assuming that people are gonna approach brokers uh, for, for private lending. 
work with someone that you trust, right? So for example, um, we do a lot of private art lending ourselves uh, in our office, but we are fairly conservative. Right, we always want to plan an exit strategy. So, how are we getting these funds back? That's most important. Again, we could have a client that, um, you know, perhaps they need fifty thousand dollars to complete a renovation. Um, but again, being on the broker side, we are qualifying these clients. So, we're looking at income documents. We're looking at credit history. We're trying to find ways. Okay, great. If we get that fifty thousand dollars, how are we going to be able to pay that fifty thousand dollars back? Right. Um, I would say every different broker, private lender it is different in their own strategies. Some are conservative, some are a little bit more risky. I would say just like the stock market, right? You got some risky uh, investments out there. You have some fairly conservative investments out there. The whole thing with private lending is that uh, make sure that you, you know, you understand um, what you're getting into by, again, working with a broker, someone that you trust. Um, at the same time, uh, always plan that exit strategy um, and keep in mind that your money is secured against property. Okay, so um, again, you could have a property that's worth a million dollars and it has a first mortgage on it for 500,000 and the client is looking for $50,000, you know, you're just over, you know, 50% loan to value, you're 50%, 55% loan to value with your second mortgage. You're fairly safe there. There's lot, lots of equity in that property, okay? Um, you could now look at another property that the client has a $900,000 first mortgage, property is valued at a million dollars, and they're looking for 50,000. So with the 900 and the $50,000 private, you're financing that person at 95% loan to value, not a smart exit strategy, not a smart deal. Uh, there might be some uh, lenders that are willing to do that deal. We're definitely not one of them. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, but yeah, the, the whole thing with private is there is um, there is money to be made. Um, I would say private private rates. Uh, if you're looking at return on your money, second mortgages traditionally start at anywhere between you know uh, ten to uh, ten to twelve to fourteen percent. So. If you're kind of guaranteed that uh, that 12% return on your money, it's uh, it, it could be a, a fairly lucrative uh, in be, uh, be a, uh, investment vehicle. So as an investment, I know we have this kind of debate all the time, and I know you've invested a lot of your money into private mortgages as well too. But so we talk about property versus investing in mortgages, right? So investing in mortgages is great. You get a guaranteed return, 10 to 15% plus lender fees, all that stuff. Maybe on a first, you might get a little lower than that. But yeah. at the end of the day, yeah, it's guaranteed, sure, but you don't get the appreciation that you get on, on and plus the leverage that you get on real estate, right? So we were talking about that the other day. Yeah, you opened uh, up my eyes the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Let's bring that up a little bit. So uh, we're talking about, you know, not investing in a big house or something, but we're talking about just a single family uh, a condo that you can rent out, you know, five, six, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars that you can rent yeah. a single tenant or maybe a roommate. Um, at the end of the day, just one door. Yeah. And, um, you know, what, what's your thoughts on that? So I, I know you said something that you hit on a, on a point about, paying off the mortgage in 25 years. Yep. And if you did nothing else, but did that, bought a single one property a year or, yep. or even every two years, whatever, you're guaranteed in 25 years, you're gonna get a free condo. Yes, yes. And that's not even looking at appreciation and, and, and potential for rents, right? Um, so yeah, I think that the conversation that you and I were having is, that, you know, if I had $100,000, I could lend that money out. Uh, let's just say second mortgage, 12%. I'm gonna make $12,000 on that money. In addition to my interest, I'm gonna get a lender fee. So let's just say on average right now, lender fees are 2%, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna make $14,000 a year on that 100,000. Um, you know, the example that you gave me is, you know, I could take that 100,000 and put that into a, let's just say a $500,000 condo, right? Um, so there's my 20% down, I'm avoiding CMHC. Um, if what are what are the returns on condos right now like over the last year uh well month year over year from last august to this august was like eight point something percent in toronto so we'll call it eight percent but so, uh even even five percent on okay. on that yeah so i guess like even like let's just say you know eight percent um now i'm not just looking at the eight percent on my hundred thousand i'm looking at the eight percent on that purchase price of five hundred thousand Bingo. And, that, and that's where you open up my, <laughs> open <laughs> my mind, right? I'm like, wow, you know, that actually makes sense. So I think as far as that goes, diversifying is definitely a smart thing. And, um, you know, you can uh, potentially even uh, put that $100,000 to work a lot hard, harder for you. Uh, big misconception, and if I'm going off track here, just kind of, you know, pull me back in, because I, I love talking as you guys can see, <laughs> is, uh, 
a lot of people assume that you know if you've already bought a property your second property third property fourth property that you buy you have to put 20 percent down and that's not the case and ken you're living living proof of that brother <laughs> oh yeah don't say anything yet hasn't told you yet. <laughs> but anyway but that but but that's the thing right it's um it, it definitely is a possibility people do have to understand that they're understand their options so if you have a hundred thousand dollars sitting there yeah you could potentially um you know put that down on a five hundred thousand dollar condo let's just say right there's your 20 percent down or you could split it in half and put fifty thousand dollars down on, on two condos there is uh there is that uh, potential possibility yeah because at, at five percent appreciation on, on five hundred thousand is what twenty five thousand at 8%, it's 40,000, 10%, it's 50,000. And I know it's all speculative. You never know if that's actually gonna continue on. I mean, so far it has been because Toronto is a growing city yep. and uh, you hear different opinions, but even if it doesn't happen, you'll have a tenant paying off your mortgage and yes. guaranteed in 25 years, if you just continue to pay your mortgage by having a tenant or even pay out of pocket, whatever it might be, you're gonna get a free condo. And in 25 years, it's gonna be worth a lot more than what you paid for it now. Yes, and like, that's why I say long term, you, you can't go wrong. So there's a lot of these people that, you know, kind of hesitant or on the fence about potentially getting into the market. Um, it, it all depends on, on what your goals are. But again, the way that I see it, and I'm sure you guys would agree long term, you, you, you can't can't really lose, right? So you, you also touch on something really quickly about uh, diversifying and, and somebody just asked me this the other day, would you uh, diversify your excess cash flow in uh, the stock market? And I'm doing it just for fun, just to speculate and all that kind of stuff. And there's not a lot of money at all by any means, but I'm just playing around just for fun. I'm not actually yeah. counting on that stock portfolio to take off because it's so scary. Yes. Up and down all the time. So I told them, you know what? You can actually diversify within real estate, such as what we were just talking about, right? So you buy a couple of properties, might be commercial, multi-unit, residential, whatever, um, whatever it might be. And you can even diversify on location. You can diversify on privates even yes no m right. most definitely most definitely and, the and you can put into a fund you can do whatever you know yeah. the Ryan Denhauer mortgage fund right <laughs> it's coming <laughs> <laughs> coming <All right. laughs> you know it could be a whole bunch of things you could put it in so many different things uh, you know what brother I, I agree man and uh I'm not uh, I'm not kind of any kind of financial planner and perhaps you guys might have a, a financial planner or financial advisor on the show one day um, but you know if I can go back and like give any kind of advice to, um, uh, to you know let's just say the Millennials out there or even someone finishing high school right now or people in their early 20s and it doesn't have to be your early 20s even if you're in your early 30s or 40s 40s even yes you is, haven't bought is, anything is, is set up an automatic uh, an automatic savings plan, right? Um, uh, go back and, you know, money that you're really not gonna miss. Like, look what we spend money on today. We spend money on everything, right? So, you know, $100 a month, you're not gonna miss, okay? You set it up as early as possible, 18, 19, 20, 30, 40, whatever the case may be, into, uh, uh, let's just say, a mutual fund or an ETF at your bank or even an institution that you don't do your regular banking with so you don't see it. $100 a month goes in, you set it and you forget it, okay? Sorry to interrupt, that's, that's what drew me to you in the first place when you were a little kid working at TD, but <laughs> you did that. Yeah, you did that. You were diligent. You actually say set aside money, and you you were yeah, you were so regimented. That's amazing. Yeah, and, and you know what? It, it's so funny. You look back at stories now when you're younger, and you know people telling you, "Hey, save your money, save your money," and you're looking at them like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." Well, you know, some of us took that advice. Some of us, some of us didn't. Um, but again, you know, if I can go back um now I, I i did it just because i had the opportunity of working in, in a bank at an early age um uh, maybe I, I probably would have increased the automated uh amounts even more but set up something automatic forget about it put it in a hundred dollars a month fifty dollars a month whatever it is and the thing that you know a lot of millennials nowadays have on their uh you know have in their you know to take advantage of is time right like you said Time is gonna pass, right? If you go with a 25 year uh, uh, amortized mortgage, if you're 20 years old, you're gonna be 45 with a, a free and clear condo, right? Um, set it, forget it, 
let it grow over time and that kind of sets you in for your diversification. You'll have mutual funds, you'll still be able to have excess mon money to save. Um, you'll have, you know, um, uh, properties that are appreciating in value. And again, too, if you have some other funds that are sitting there, potentially look at getting into private lending. Um, the only advice I can get is, you know, get in contact with brokers, you know, interview them, see if you trust them, see if they do private lending uh, and, and kind of take it from there. Right, right, right. It's the power of compounding as well, too, right? And sure. what's that rule, the rule of seven or something that it should double in seven years? Did you hear about that? Yes, sir. Yeah. So what's yeah. that rule like again? I don't, I don't remember this. It's your financial advisor. I, I, vaguely. <laughs> <laughs> Vaguely, but uh, again, like I, I think that um, you know, with, with with various investments out there, and and can I think you know you're living proof of it as well. Like real estate, you know, a lot of it uh, as well. You know, I think you know, especially in the in the GTA and specifically the the Toronto market, I think some of it has doubled in, in a lot less than seven years, um, depending on on your investment. Would you say so? Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's just, well, it's, it's kind of speculative because it doesn't happen all the time. But uh, right now in this growing city for whatever happened, whether it's Drake or whoever put Toronto on the map, it's, it's just like, it's blown up. And, and I think it was it, Kenneth Yim and, yeah. Yeah, and, and Rye the Mortgage Guy. <laughs> <laughs> we did help a lot of people in the city, so. <laughs> yeah. John, if you had to start over again, what would you do differently? John? Buy more real estate. <laughs> 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 I would I would honestly do do the same my uh, um, you know going back uh, let's just say eight years ago uh, my whole thing is I, I want to get my home base ready first I don't want to invest in, in real estate until I bought you know the house where myself and my family was going to uh, was going to live in um, if I were to go back I would completely change that where you know I was living at home with mom and dad uh, I should have bought then um, because if that was the case, I could have potentially, um, you know, been living at home, rent free, mortgage free, buying a property, having a tenant pay that property. And even if the property didn't cash flow, even if there was a shortfall, the way I look at it is it's a poor savings plan. So what I would have to put 200 or $300 out of my own pocket into that property every month, you know, if I go and fast forward eight years later now, you know, I'd probably, uh, I'm not complaining now, but I, I'd probably be really happy with my decisions uh, back then. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And you know, um, speaking of your own home as an investment, Robert Kiyosaki, and I've always told this people as well too, that your own home is never your own investment. But actually, I, I put my thinking the other day, actually, that it should be an investment. It is kind of investment because if you're not, if you don't own your home, you're renting, you're not building equity. Right? Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. You're, like unless you have a truly disciplined life like Ryan did when he was younger. Or Doug, <laughs> first day, um, it's, it's hard to save that money and build a, like a little nest egg, right? Yeah. And yes, it's hard to go from once you own to rent something. It's hard to do that, um, which is why the people say that it should never be an investment. But it truly can be your own investment. You can borrow against it, right? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, but you could probably, you can take a, a line of credit out of it. You can remortgage yeah. your house. You to take some equity out and put it somewhere else and uh, build it again and multiply. Exactly, and that's why you know go back to the first point that I made on uh, on this uh, on this you know this video shoot here is that for investors you know plan you know kind of your short term goals but also plan your long term goals um, you know the more properties you have uh, you know it is more difficult to get financing so if you could plan ahead of time and kind of set your properties up with lines of credits right from the start well again fast forward you know five years ten years down the road. You know, you have five properties, you have 10 properties. Well, you had tenants paying down those mortgages and all that equity in those properties now are readily available for you to use at any point in time and invest on more properties, right? So um, that's advice I'd give to a lot of investors out there. Or mortgages. Or mortgages. <laughs> or the Ryan Denhauer Fund. Exactly, it's coming. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, uh, you know what? I'm happy to see your career growth and I'm happy to see where you've taken your, your, yourself as well, too. Uh, yeah, that's you. amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, growth. man, you, you, uh, you, I, I think you were the, the one, uh, one of the people that, that inspired me, uh, 
when I was working at TD back then, you'd always say, right, you know, I think you're going places. I think you're going places. I know you're going places. And uh, <laughs> look at it, here we are. You know, we, uh, I'm a partner in Bespoke Mortgage Group. We're an independent mortgage brokerage based out of Etobicoke. Um, yeah, I, I, I never thought that this would have happened. And I think that you can see from, uh, you know, the smile on my face every time I talk about mortgages, I get excited. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, buddy. No. Um, the other thing you should also mention is that uh, you're, you're not just based out of Tokyo. You also do Toronto. You do everywhere, right? Bond, yeah. So, Bond. so the nice thing is that we're mobile. Right, so um, a, a lot of the work that we do is remotely, um, so where we can, um, you know, approve your mortgage over the computer and telephone. We could even do a video conference call, such as this. Um, right, so whether you're buying in Niagara, Hamilton, Sudbury, if people, you know, want to buy wherever, um, we can assist them. Right, um, which is nice. It's you have access to to products and you have access to to lenders at your fingertips opposed to walking into various branches and waiting and taking time sitting in traffic yada 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 we have we have options and, and solutions and uh it's all about being flexible that's awesome cool thank, thank you well, i'm glad to have you on the show ryan and i'd love to catch up with you in a, in a little bit when you uh get your first investment property and yes, you start building sure. it that way diversify away from mortgages <laughs> i don't forget <laughs> and let's catch up with you and see how you're doing in uh in a few months for sure, guys. Hey, thank you so much for having me. This is Thanks awesome. Thanks for us. All right, bud. <laughs> See ya. See you guys. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Before you go. Yeah. How can they get in touch with you? How can people get in touch with you? Oh, oh, um, uh, you can follow me on Instagram. So Rye the Mortgage Guy. I'm on Instagram. I, I try and post uh, as often as possible um, based off, you know, things that we we're just talking about. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out directly. Uh, you could reach me uh, at, on my email, ryan at bmtgg.ca. Um, would love to hear from you. And just remember, you know, I think I was one of them as well. Uh, in the past, I, I was scared to ask questions to, you know, investors, individuals, people that I looked up to, other people in the industry that I wanted to get into, because uh, I thought it wasn't a good question. Uh, just remember, there's never not a good question. So anything on your minds, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. And just like uh, John says, what, what's the thing you say? Just do it. <laughs> do it. Yeah, do that, John. <laughs> what's that? Yeah, that's right. That's true. I don't think the viewers know about that. Or, or okay. <laughs> well, we'll show you the clip later on, but that video we talked about. Yeah. That was a good clip. But if there's any advice that we can give you as well, is you got to take action. Just get started somehow. I agree. Right. I agree. All right. Well, thanks for joining us and uh, catch up with you soon. Yes. Thank you so much. All right, buddy. Take care. Take care. If you like what you just watched, don't forget to click to subscribe. We're on Apple iTunes and YouTube as well. And visit us at www.tronomonopoly.ca. Thanks for watching.